Um, welcome all. My name is Julian Jones. Um, welcome to this uh, presentation. Um, I work in a small department in uh, SIPSI membership, um, which basically deals with uh, our volunteer groups and they're the regions, the groups, the societies of which Sophie is one of them. Um, before I hand over to Malcolm, who will explain more about what um, the Society of Public Health Engineers does, um, I just wanted to, to talk about briefly from a membership point of view, what, what we offer. Um, I, some of you on, your, on this call will hopefully be Sophie members, but some of you will not. Um, if basically there's a lot, there's different grades of membership available um, according to your experience and qualifications. And um, before I start waffling on too much, I just want to say that if you're not sure about your, if your qualifications and experience meet the particular criteria, please get in touch. We can guide you through the process. We can help you along the way. Um, you may be surprised at, at the kind of level that you can obtain. And um, yeah, we're, we're here to help in that respect. So um, it, it's a fairly, fairly simple process, um, application, and an interview. Um, so, so that's all I wanted to say, really. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Malcolm. Thanks, Julian. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Malcolm Atherton. I work for a company called Cundall, uh, based up here in, in sunny Manchester. Um, and I'm the Sophie Northern representative. Um, for those of you who don't know much about Sophie, uh, it was actually founded uh, down in London roughly uh, 20 years ago. Uh, as Julian has indicated, we are actually affiliated to SIBSI. Our aim, or primary aims, is to provide a higher profile and focus for PH engineers within SIBSI uh, and also within the wider building services industry. As well as these technical uh, events that we do uh, up and around the country, um, there are social events, albeit that pandemic has sort of put a, a kibosh uh, on them. But uh, we do do things like uh, trips to um, manufacturers' factories in, in the likes of Germany, France and Spain, uh, amongst many other different countries. Uh, we have a number of different regional um, secretaries, representatives, uh, as well as myself up here in the north. Um, we also have London, which is Stuart Brown, uh, South West, uh, Scotland, uh, West Midlands, which is Rod Green, a good friend of mine who I know is on, on the call. Then we also have the likes of Australia, New Zealand, and even the UAE. Um, as at January, 2021, we had approximately 1,100 individual members worldwide, which is a decent size. Um, and in addition to which, we also have what we call industrial associate members, which are the manufacturers, um, you know, water treatment people, uh, the likes of which BWT are one. And currently, there's about 69 or 70 of those members. So. Uh, I won't take up any more of Heidi's time. Uh, I know how precious it is. So, Heidi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Malcolm. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Heidi Pengeli. I am the National Sales Manager for the Commercial Division of BWT UK. I would like to thank you in advance for attending this presentation, which has been broken down into three sections as it's going to be presented on Microsoft Teams today. Firstly, I would like to introduce BWT, then we'll go through the CPD on lime scale control through the use of physical conditioners and water softeners, and then finally, a little introduction to BWT products. The presentation and material we look, forward to, we look at today will hopefully be of interest to you all, um, and we can have a short forum afterwards um, for any questions you may have, um, and please don't hesitate to um, contact question me if there's anything as we go through. Okay, so BWT is, stands for Best Water Technology. Uh, our aim is to better than others on everything we do. 
Our mission is to develop, produce, sell and service products and process for the entire water cycle. And our solution, we apply our whole worldwide leading know-how to all areas of water treatment. We are Europe's leading water technology company. As you can see from the dark blue, this is the number of BWT subsidiaries in the countries we're supplying. And the lighter blue um, is the partners. We were formed back in 1823. And since that form, we have um, rec recognized a number of companies. The one which is noticeable for us was back in 2010 when BWT took over Culligan UK. Um, and from there on, we have gone on leaps and bounds. The current turnover is 670 million. We have over 5,000 employees. Um, we have six production facilities and eight R&Ds, which cover a range of countries from Australia, um, Austria, China, etc. And in the UK, we have six locations. Our head office is based in High Wycombe and we have a manufacturing site in Billingham and we have a bottling plant in Swindon. Our scope of products is quite unique. Um, we, we're from the right top end of ultra water. We treat from mineral water, drinking water to process and mainly on our side, the boiler, cooling and air conditioning water, heating, and in Europe, we're becoming one of the biggest swimming pool um, supp equipment suppliers as well. So within our expertise, we have a number of different divisions. Um, today, I have my commercial hat on, but we also manufacture products for the domestic technology, um, pharma and biotech, um, and the pool technology that was mentioned. And in these systems, we are looking at filtration, softening, limescale protection, dosing, UVs, ozone um, and then we also have the consumer products such as water jugs, water dispensers, point of use um, and also the catering industry where we supply cartridges especially for um, supplying treated water for coffee etc. Okay so today you're here to listen to the CPD. I hope you're all out there because I can't see you so you may have to cough and everything to let me know you're still there but we'll go through it slowly um, but if there's any questions let me know. So the, the presentation is on lime scale control through the use of physical conditioners and water softeners. And our content, it consists of an introduction, water hardness and lime scale, water, uh, water hardness problems, what should be done and, um, and what are the options, water softeners and the working principles, physical conditioners and working principles, so how we size a product, the next generation, which is nanocrystals, installation considerations, summary, conclusion, and at the finish, any questions. I'm sorry for anything of what I say we discussed today is what you already know. I don't mean to be insult anybody's intelligence, but I thought it'd be worth reiterating. Here we have an illustration of the hydrological cycle showing how water ultimately moves through the land, sea and the air on a continuous cycle, picking up both elements along the route that create lime scale, which is a form of calcium and magnesium. Geographically, the extent of this will vary. As you can see from the illustration on the map of the UK, the lighter colour, a percentage of the country is affected by some level of hard water, Whereas others, certain areas, you will also note that in particular the south, southeast, east and northeast all tend to suffer from very hard water. Here we have, sorry, here we see water in the UK is generally very hard with the most of the country in a diagonal line between the seven. And the Tees estuary is exhibiting a hardness of above 200 ppm, which is also calcium carbonate equivalent. Wales, Devon, Cornwall and parts of the northeast are softer water areas ranging from 20 to 200 ppm. Generally, water in most urban areas is hard except where growing cities during the Industrial Revolution built infrastructures to build in water from other sources to accommodate its industrial activities and growing populations. Notable examples are Manchester and Birmingham who receive their water from Lake District and Elan 
Valley in Wales, uh, which is a soft water area. There are three different types of water hardness. We have the temporary hardness due to the presence of dissolved calcium magnesium bicarbonate, which will participate when the water is heated into form scale. We have permanent hardness due to dissolved calcium magnesium sulfate and chlorides. It cannot be removed by heating and combines with soap and detergents to form a curd or a scum. And then we have total hardness, the sum of both temporary and permanent hardness, which is used when we size water softeners. The average hardness in the water in the UK is around about 300 ppm. We have different degrees, uh, different measurements um, for hardness. Um, as you can see from the bit of pipe, um, the, um, the scale builds up within the side. But when you look at the measurements, it can be degrees Clark, parts per million, ppm, milligrams per litre, grains per gallon, and even French, German, or Russian degrees. When the harness builds up in the tube, as you can see, um, it reduces ball flow and, and uh, efficiency um, of the heating systems. All values expressed as ppm, or known as CO3. So if it's classed as soft, it's between 0 to 50 ppm, slightly hard 101 to 150, hard 201 to 300, and very hard 300 and above. So what happens? Hardness shortens equipment life, such as steam boilers, chlorifiers, plate heat exchangers, causes damage to washing machines, dishwashers, steam humidifiers, and causes problems with cooling towers and evaporated condensers. Most things with an element are where heat is added to hard water. You get increased operating costs, increased maintenance, the heating and energy costs go up. You can get spotting on utensils once they've been through a dishwasher. You can get scum on beverages and you get very poor ice quality. You can also see from the diagram that scale buildup costs the UK 1 billion on efficiency losses and 1% buildup of a line scale on a heating system equates to 10 efficiency loss. Okay, uh, water harness problems. So scale forms rapidly when heating or heated at temperatures over 55 degrees centigrade, which has a knock on effect with products like the new generation heaters, which offer preheating and storage. Here we experience definite scale problems if issue is not addressed early enough. Warranties on equipment can be affected if the feed water is recognised as hard and no pretreatment has been installed to protect it. It's worth potentially invalidating any guarantee. Mar manufacturers usually specify preferred hardness somewhere between slightly hard and moderately hard. And to an extremely important point to note closely is that scale can harbour bacteria such as Legionella, which then presents much more potential serious issues that will need addressing later. So what should be done? Um, product protection. Every appliance plant that comes into contact with moderately hard or hard water should be protected. It's worth considering if the budget permits this. Remember, the harder the water or the hotter it's heated, the greater need for scale control. So what are the options for scale control? There are ultimately two recognized methods and also new emerging technologies. However, we do need to be clear on the features and benefits of each as they employ different methods introducing different results. We have iron exchange, which we know as water softening. We have physical conditioners, which is a range from magnetic, electromagnetic, electrolytic, electronics, or a, the uh, sacrificial anode. And then the new next generation conditioners, which is the nanocrystal technology. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to go through water softeners. Um, hopefully you're still out there and you're still with me. So we'll see where we go. Okay, iron exchange, the technology used in a water is a method of exchanging ions in a solution with ions of the same charge in certain insoluble substances. Through so using the, the technology, chemicals can be removed from solution that contains large amounts of other chemicals. We will look at, at an illustration on how this is done on the next couple of slides. 
but for example, hardness in water, which is caused by calcium magnesium ions, which form insoluble compounds, is filtered through an artificial zeolite, or as we know it as resin. And the sodium of the resin replaces the undesirable ions that are in the water. When the resin is saturated with these metallic ions, it is washed with salt solution, which restores the sodium, allowing it to continue the process to produce soft water through the same repeated process. In the UK, water softeners uh, use a cation exchange resin. Cation means that it is, tracks positively charged ions, such as calcium carbonate, and exchanges these ions for sodium existing in the resin. So here we have the illustration of the process we have just explained. The water, sorry, the hardness in the water caused by the calcium, which is Ca, and the magnesium Mg, which forms insoluble compounds, is removed by exchange. Water is filtered through the resin presented by the brown and the sodium Na. Replaces the other ions that are in the water. When the resin is saturated with these metallic ions, it's washed with salt solution, which restores the sodium. Water softeners operation. Working principle, there are five different uh, settings for softener, which is done automatically. A brine door, where the water is drawn up through the uh, brine flow to the resin vessel to charge the resin through the sodium of the salt. Then you have the slow rinse, which is immediately after brining the softener. You have a full backwash, which flushes the uh, system through and the resin beads. And then finally, you have the fast rinse, which um, is a short, fast downflow rinse, which is performed to remove the last of the brine and, and settle the resin bed. And then the unit will go back into service all automatically. OK, we have examples and options for water softeners. Water softeners are produced in various sizes and shapes and more common looking unit that may be familiar with the domestic style, which is the cabinet type. These are small units uh, which sit under kitchen cupboards, etc., um, and I have an integral brine tank. We have the simplex, which is a single vessel uh, with a separate brine tank. Um, a wide range of units with separate free freestanding brine tanks. This is ultimately used when there is softened water storage tank and multiple units can be linked if required. Then we can go on to the duplex or twin vessel. This provides a duty standby system where there are no storage facility vessels switched between duty whilst regenerating, ensuring continuous un in uninterrupted flow. These come with a separate brine tank. You can also have a triplex, which is uh, two units in duty in parallel and one in standby. And these are used when flows are very high or um, the room is, is quite tight and you need to go to smaller vessels. Then finally, we have duty assist softeners, used when there are peaks in water and used to operate in a small assist vessel. Duty assist units use a smaller secondary vessel, which only operates when there is a peak in a usage and then reverts to one vessel when the peak ceases. The units have a high degree of diagnostics and monitor the complete process as well as self-cleaning and flushing to ensure the system does not foul. OK, so we have old and new range of softeners. Here we have the illustration example for the most common found old technology and the new ergonomic designs coming from the market with a high level of automation and self-diagnostics. So sizing, what do we need to know? Um, ideally, um, daily water usage, litres per hour, days per week, etc. in worst case scenario. We need to know what the water hardness is. Um, we can either do a test or we can get the postcode and um, find it that way. Uh, what's the maximum flow rate? Um, do you have a flow meter or do you, are you installing it after a pump and you get it that way? Applications for the softener need to understand where it's going. So we do we need to have a duplex, simplex, that helps. 
pipe size, you don't want to put a three quarter inch unit on a three inch pipe, your pressure drop will be horrendous. And what's the pressure of the incoming um, water? Ideally, we need 1.72 bars a minimum, um, otherwise it will not backwash correctly. And is there any storage? Um, once softened water can be stored, is the storage sufficient to meet demand whilst product regenerates? And understanding the application is key and will minimise any potential problems in the future. OK, that's water softeners. Um, we can hold questions to the end, but anything anybody wants to ask quickly? Are we still out there? Heidi, if there are any questions, I suspect the people will uh, type them in into the chat box. Right, lovely. OK, so right, we're going to twiddle on now to physical water conditioners, um, which is, as I've mentioned before, magnetic, electrolytic, electronic, electromagnetic, and then finally the nanocrystals. Physical water conditioner is an umbrella term used to describe a group of products which can reduce or prevent the formation of hard limestone in areas supplied with hard water. Some needs the main supply and they are designed to offer a practical low cost alternative to chemical water treatment such as water softeners. They usually fit and forget devices which improve appliance performance and prolong appliance life due to the pro problems encountered in hard scale buildup. Physical water conditioners can be magnetic, electrolytic, catalytic, electrostatic, electromagnetic, or even electronic. The precise requirements influence which type of install, especially whether it's to be used for treating a single appliance or a whole property or building. The size of the property or project may also influence the design of the installation. Physical water conditions stabilize the calcium and magnesium in the water, which leads to the reduction or prevention of the buildup of hard light scale. Sometimes soft scale forms, but this is generally easy to remove. Some conditioners will also progressively remove existing scaling pipes, water cylinders and water feed equipment, but all at a very low rate. Physical conditioners alter the way scale forms by influencing the crystal structure of the scaling minerals. They alter the alignment of the mineral molecules during crystalline formation so that they are encouraged to form long chains, as you will see from the illustration on the slide. These develop into sharp, thin crystals called agonaut. This inhibits the standard random formation of calcite. Argonite crystals, due to their shape, are less likely to form hard scale or adhere to hard surfaces by, or each other um, than the more common calcite. Okay. Most devices work by passing the water supply through a magnetic field. The magnetic unit uses a fixed ferrite magnet inside a tubular body. The electrolytic unit uses differential metals to generate a microcurrent when water passes through it. And the electromagnetic and electronic units use a coil winding to induce an electromagnetic field on the pipework and surrounding area. The field strengthens entirely different magnitudes. This magnet field in the water supply alters the charge of the scale forming minerals to encourage crystalline formation in a chain rather than layers. And then finally, the sacrificial anode units release a metallic element into the water, which reacts with the scale elements to form agonite. Here we have an illustration of the example of the old technology and the new ergonomic designs coming to the market. Here you can see the effect of one of the traditional methods, RAS approval generally required. DVGW512 now applies to the benchmark test for the efficiency of water conditioners. So what do we need to size them? So there are two or three pieces of information required to size a, a physical water conditioner. However, one or the other can be used as sometimes a product with a smaller flow rate or pipe size connection may be suitable and acceptable. We need to consider the finance budgets may um, influence this as well. Pipe size, flow rate, total water use in the case of nanocrystal technology, and understand the application, it may help to determine the best product and, and installation. OK. 
Okay, so that's that side of the um, information. We're now going to go on to the new nanocrystal technology. So here we have an illustration of the next generation of nanocrystal technology. The, these do not use an magnet, magnetism technology previously discussed. The water is carefully metered and a precise voltage is applied across the internal electrodes. The units slightly alter the lime carbonic acid equi equilibrium and nanocrystals are formed, which are carried through the heating system in solution. The special electrode consists of electrically conductive, which is in red, and non-conductive, which is yellow, particles. The special structure of the electrode creates an extremely large surface area. Following the application of the electric charge to the electrode, each electrically conductive particle represents a bipole, i.e. it possesses both a positive and negative end. The entire electrode has the effect of a large number of bipolar electrodes. The polarity inversion causes the bipole to change its polarity. What was previously positive becomes negative and vice versa. As you can see from the illustration, the hardness minerals are deposited and dispersed, which we also call nanocrystals. Any calcium carbonate previously deposited in the negative side of the bipole is forced away again after the polarity inversion. This action perverts crystal growth. Each small particle has a zeat potential. This is a charge which causes particles to attract or repel each other. The conditioning process results in a net negatively electrical charge around each nanocrystal as they all have the same electrical charge and agglomeration of the nanocrystals are effectively prevented due to the mutual repelling. So what, so for water softening installations, you need to consider the following points. Accessibility. The product will require servicing and salt to be added on a regular basis. There will need to be a power supply, if they're one close. You will need drainage. You need a flat surface, potentially tall vessels need to be flat surface and height and health and safety. Also lifting of salt bags, which can be as heavy as 25 kilograms above waist height. Whereas the physical water conditioners need a power supply, accessibility, installed on gravity downfeed from central water tank is installed in the correct position, reference to the manufacturer's installation guidance, fitted ideally electromagnetics after booster pumps, and understanding the application and product requirements we could do with surveying the site. So, physical water crushers do not soften the water if you have 300 ppm going into it, you will have 300 ppm coming out. They inhibit the formation of hard scale buildup. They are a fit and forget product and they require minimum ongoing maintenance. And they are a cost effective solution. Whereas water softeners turn hard water to soft water, they break down existing form scale over time. They require ongoing maintenance and salt to be added on continuous. There is also going to be cost for maintenance and there needs to be consideration for the salt storage and handling. So what we should be thinking about is what's the objective? What's the budget? What is expected required from the product? Is it to soften the water and prevent buildup of scale or simply to prevent the buildup of scale? That is the CPD Apps presentation over. And now we're going to go through just a little bit about BWT, and then we can answer questions at the end. So as we just explained, BWT has a range of products which form the, from the present CPD presentation, from line scale protection, but we also do filtration and dosing uh, for the domestic area. 
and we manufacture 32,000 domestic water softeners up our bidding in site. Um, as you can see, with the blue lids on. Whereas commercially, we are looking for similar active um, products, but much on a lot larger scale. Filtration, softening, lime scale protection, membranes through reverse osmosis, UV disinfection, uh, for applications such as drinking water, boarding, boiler water, cooling, etc., heating, and seawater, not so much in the UK, but more for Europe. The commercial products consist of uh, a range of softeners, UVs, ROs, filters, as you can see, product brochures are available. And the kind of industries we're looking at are pharma, food and beverage, hotel catering, universities, communities, um, hospitals. And we obviously have the drinking water side where we can supply point of use or coolers with, with 19, 11 litres bottles. We also have the point of use, which is the filter cartridges, which can be present bought through places like Amazon. And we have the point of use, which is where we supply filter systems for the uh, to provide scale free, um, nice, pure water for drinking at kitchen taps. And these are some of the companies which we've dealt with through the BWT group for the domestic side, commercial side, food and beverage, some names there you will recognise. And finally, who we are. Myself, Kay, and unfortunately the two, there are two people who are no longer with BWT, but they can see the areas we're covering. And there's a little Formula One car, which you may hear today that we are still sponsoring um, uh, Formula One. We can provide conversion charts for you to help with the hardness. Um, so that hopefully I can answer any questions which you may have. Heidi or, and or Kay, um, there have been a number of questions um, okay. going all the way back uh, probably about 10 minutes ago. Um, I don't know if you want me to read them out or Kay or Heidi, do you want to you want to read them out yourselves? It's entirely up to you. Up to you. How do you want to do this? Go on now. Um, you can, you can read, read, read them out and we'll see what we can do. <laughs> Right, I will start start off with one, and, and and there was a little bit of a discussion going on in terms oh, of um, if temporary hardness can be removed by boiling. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if somebody happens to live in a hard water area, how high would the permanent hardness be be affecting their health? And that uh, there was another question also associated with the health effects of hard water. How, how, uh, health effects affecting your hard, you know, that hard water may affect your health, yes or no? Natu hard water, as, um, as we, we've seen hard water go up as, about, as high as about 450 up in the Lincolnshire area. Um, it, it does more problems with machinery washing etc um we're more used to removing it than the level is actually maximum hardness um i can find out what our stipulation is but um i'm haven't come across a maximum of what it will do if it's higher than say the standard of 300 350 but i can right. find out and a statement that was made that you, you know, you could either say this is correct or not, but somebody made the statement that you will need a hard water tap if you have a salt softener installed, as RAS it, it, don't recommend the consumption of salt softened water. Right, OK. It is not recommended, nothing in writing, that you should not drink softened water. It is not good for babies with formula milk or um, people with high blood pressure. 
we strongly recommend you have a separate tap in because if the water board wants to come and test your water and it's completely soft, they're not happy. So you should have a separate drinking water tap, whether it's your whether you choose to do that soften water through a reverse osmosis unit at your kitchen tap or you have your garden tap on hard water. But there should be a hard water tap in the property. Um, and apologies if you think I'm swearing here, but does an electromag water softener work the same as the salt softeners? No. A water conditioner does not remove the hardness. So electromagnetic is just changing the um, condition of the water. With a water hard, with a water softener with which is uses salt, that will take out the hardness. It cannot revert it back. Once it's soft, it remains soft. Okay. Uh, next one. Does passive inline scale removal work? <laughs> I'll be average job if it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have to be careful of what you put in and where you put it. Every bit of equipment has a certain limit. So, and they are designed to be placed in posi certain positions. So depending on which bit of kit you're put using, it depends on whether it, where it goes. Yes, it will then depend on whether it works or not. Okay. Um, under normal use, what's the typical lifespan of, of one of the units? Which type of unit? Uh, the, the question doesn't say, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. The domestically small inline, like the um, electrolytics, you're looking about five to seven years. Whereas if you're going down the line of electromagnetics, 10 to 15 years. If you're going down base exchange softening, resin will last about 10 years, but depends on how much use it's got, how much chlorine's in the water, depends on how long it will last. But you should get between 10 to 15 years out of a base exchange softener. Okay. Uh, do you have any test data to show the effectiveness of the product at various hardness levels? Again, which product? It doesn't say, unfortunately. <laughs> OK, all right. Um, with a base exchange softener, you can test the water. There are test kits available where you can test the water going into the unit. And we would recommend you put sample points prior to the unit and after. Uh, and you can then gauge how much. And a commercially rated softener, if it's working correctly, should get you down to being, say, from 300 down to 0 to 10 ppm. With a water conditioner, the hardness going in will be the same going in as it comes out. So you can't test anything. OK. Uh, next one. Can the nanotechnology be used for drinking water? Yes, because it's RAS approved. OK. Uh, somebody here. Um, right. Last year, I had to have super drain remove line scale from the waste water pipes of a building, even though there was a softener and dosing regime in place, along with a copper silver ionization unit for Legionella. Is it normal that deposits gather in drainage even after softening? Uh, softening drainage, it's higher levels of sodium. Um, I would probably question how often they're putting salt in the softener. Okay. Um, can soften water be used to fill heating systems? Um, it can, but there are better solutions than soften um, deionized water or demineralized water is, is a better solution. Um, but you can use softeners to top up heating systems. Um, but there's a mix, there's a new idea at the moment that demineral, uh, demineralized water would be better. OK, there's one or two more questions concerning hard water associated with your health, so I won't read them again. Does chemical softening change the pH of the water? Can slightly. Okay. Softening water can make it, um, can change it slightly, yes. Um, 
can electromagnetic scale removal be installed on LTHW returns about 60 degrees C? Uh, they, they can be put onto returns, um, ideally after the pump. Um, I would have to double check the temperature. It can, it can work too. Um, and what's your equipment you're putting on? But I can work. I can I can confirm that. Okay. Uh, and it's more of a, a statement. In fact, there's a standard for testing scale buildup, so it is possible to test physical water conditioners. This is the type of data they're looking for. Water so. right. The only product we have, which you we can confirm will do what it says on the tin. Um, is the Aquat Hotel because that has been sent through a, a independent has DVGW five one two approval, um, but there's n you can't get a test for electromagnetics because it's not changing anything as i.e. removing the hardness, but you can as I said test the basic chain softener because that definitely is going to be removing the hardness. Okay. Uh, I think I've caught up with the questions that have been typed in. <laughs> uh, apologies if I have missed any. Um, so I think we've done done pretty well there. Um, you know, if there's anybody else who got a question, please please type them in. And um, whilst we've got Heidi and Kay. Uh, quite hi. there in the background. <laughs> Sorry, Malky. I'm just going through some of the questions. Um, somebody's asked, can electromagnetic scale removal be installed on the LTHW return, which is about 60 degrees? Yeah, I read that yeah, one. Yeah, he's asked that one. I, I need to check the temperature of what of products or where they can get the highest they go. The electromagnetic would have a problem because it has a thermistor on it, and that is set for about 28 degrees. Um, so fitting an electromagnetic of ours, um, the whole reason it's there is to make sure that you don't have anything too hot, which Legionella could uh, run at. So that's why the design of it. Um, so putting it on the hot water or the low temperature hot water, that could be an issue. The, the, the unit will make could do the 60 degrees, but the design of it wouldn't be um, effective. OK. Uh, um... I'm not going to read the last one out because um, I think it's a certain dig, so I won't. I won't read it out. Oh, thanks, Malcolm. <laughs> I'm used to that, Mal. I know exactly who it is, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> you can tell me later, then. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll tell you later. Uh, somebody though has has asked: Is there an instrument for measuring the scale buildup in a pipe bore automatically? Mm. I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm certainly not aware of one, I have to admit. No, um, the only way you normally you cut the pipe in a half and you find out or you look exactly. at the element yes. and you see it. Yes. Um, and somebody's asked, how long does the, the effect affecting conditioning last? 24, 48 hours or longer? And does this make it unsuitable <laughs> locations with sporadic use? Okay, electromagnetics. Again, we've got a whole range of different things. BWT are the only ones who manufacture five different types of water conditioners. And the electromagnetics, they. Um... Sorry, Malcolm, just, can you just reread the question for me? I... Yeah. How long does the effect affecting yeah, conditioning okay. last? 24, 48 yeah. hours or longer? Okay, we understand that in the industry, there's the 48 hour rule um, of water sitting for um, will, will stay conditioned after that time or if it passes through any pumps, it will be uh, less effective. Um, whereas the Aqua Total, um, sorry, the, so that type of unit is, is, is a temporary fix, whereas the Aqua Total is a permanent fix of treatment and that can go in front of tanks, etc. And it can go a lot longer and it won't revert it. OK, uh, another question comes through. Where is the best location of this system before the water tank or the booster set or question mark? OK, knowing who I've probably got in the room, probably know where that one's coming from. Um, 
<laughs> okay, we have a number of different products on the market at the moment and a number of different ideas which we're seeing. It's always been our thought that electromagnetics should be installed after storage tanks and booster pumps if there are any, whereas the Aquatotal is suitable to be in installed prior to the storage tanks because it's, it's permanent. It's a difference between the temporary and the permanent um, effectiveness. Um, so that, it, again, is down to application and what, what you're actually doing depends on which equipment we put forward. Indeed, because a follow up to that uh, by somebody else actually was, does the pipe lagging affect the effect of electromagnetic, uh, especially if it was retrofitted? pipe lagging uh no because the water is actually going through the pipe itself so it's not the lagging the lagging will affect the temperature sensor of the pipe of the electromagnetic of our unit and the the set the, the thermistor should be pi um, wrapped around the pipe underneath the lagging okay um let's have a look with the new physical product, do they have to consider LSI water chemistry? Oh, that's a different one. Uh, LSI water chemistry. The um, Aquatotals, they will go up to 700 ppm of hardness. And we do suggest you put a filter in front of them to make sure that there's no particles going through. Um, but that, as far as I know, is the only things we have to consider with this unit. Okay, and another one's just popped up and I suspect that in a roundabout sort of way, you probably answered certainly part of this question is that somebody's using soft water for spraying systems on adiabatic coolers. Yeah. The system is fed via a storage tank. How long can yeah. the soft water be left stagnant in the tank? And does the softened water tank need to be flushed at regular intervals? Well, um, the softened water will stay soft, doesn't matter how long it's in that tank. Any water standing um, obviously has a certain period. And if there's a UV on the back end of it, then that will prevent um, any uh, bacteria going through to service. So um, I would say it's to do with the water, not actually it's softened water. Um, sitting for long periods of time in a tank and a UV would help. Yep. Okay. Um, nothing else so far. You're doing pretty well there, Heidi. <laughs> I need a drink. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, a follow up. Um, right. So following their previous questions, yeah. the DVGW slash W512 protocol tests for scale buildup over a period of time. This allows for comparison of effectiveness of various techniques. Do you yes. have any test data of this sort? We have the test uh, data we had when we put the unit through that test. Okay. Um, hopefully that's answered the question there, Mike. If uh, not, I can dig. I can dig some more. Right. We have we have the certification uh, documentation from the test lab when we put the uh, unit through for uh, five one two. Okay. Well. I think we've we, we've um, put Heidi through the through, through the mill there. I think um, <laughs> if anybody who's still on on the on the line does think of any other questions, um, you know, either contact myself um, or you know, if you want to get directly in touch with with Heidi. It's up to you at BWT or even K, by all means. I'm sure they would love to answer your questions. Um, on behalf of Sophie, and specifically Sophie Northern, can I thank you, Heidi, officially for doing the thank presentation? Uh, and, and I suppose I've got to thank Kay, who's uh, there in the background. <laughs> My psychic. <laughs> exactly. 
exactly. So um, for those of you who are still remaining on the line, can I just let you be aware that the next Sophie CPD will be Wednesday the 14th of April, not the 7th of April. That is to take account of Easter. So uh, obviously the details of that will uh, wing its way to whoever's interested nearer the time but can i just thank everybody who has been attending <laughs>